The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Ladies and gentlemen, if you heard those verses and you, if you paid close attention... That truly is the essence of Christmas, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so the great love of God as found in John chapter 3 verse 16 is all contained in those verses. And so if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe you do, you can simply believe in him for the life that he offers as per John 3.16. And there's a host of other verses in the Gospel of John. He who believes in me has everlasting life. That's from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. So Merry Christmas to you all, if I don't get to see you after service today. We're moving through the key doctrines as found in the Christmas story. We all are familiar with your typical Christmas story. You know, Mary and Joseph was with son. And uh, rightfully so, it's a beautiful story of how Jesus was born in a feeding trough. And as such, there was a lot of tension during the first Christmas, if you think about it. For example, Mary found his woman to be pregnant. And Mary said, I've never known a man. How could this be? There was a lot of stress and tension in the very first Christmas. So if you think you have difficulty going through your shopping sprees. It's nothing compared to what Joseph and Mary went through. But I would like us to look through increment number three. I, we covered increment one, two, and now this is our third increment as far as how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit coalesce together during the very first Christmas. And I'm want, I want to take us there so that we can see how involved the Father and the Holy Spirit were during the first Christmas. And the only way to be able to identify this is to carefully craft and look through what actually took place. And that's what the objective is this morning. And so we're going to sweep through this, and I'm hoping that you have a greater appreciation for Christmas because there are key truths that are found and wedded in the Scripture itself. And so that's going to be the goal this morning. So hopefully this will make sense. So here we go. Christmas has, you'll recall, I'm going to sweep, turn back just a little bit. Uh, first and second Christmas, or the first and second increment of our studies, we covered this. Christmas has a redeeming purpose. What did I mean by that? Anybody remember? What, what does it mean to have a redeeming purpose? Who recalls that? What does it mean that Christmas has a redeeming purpose? Anybody remember? I know redemption means that we're, we're bought out of the slave market of sin. Slave market of sin. Who bought us? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. So think of Christmas as someone who purchased us out of the slave market of sin. If he didn't do that, we're still stuck. We're still left in our sins, struggling with our sins. Second one is Christmas is about God with us. What does that mean? Help me out. What does it mean God is with us or God with us? What's the one word that frames it together? Incarnation. Incarnation. Starts with an E. Amen. Emmanuel. Very good, Judy. Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Anyone think of a verse that comes to mind? God with us. Think, think, think. John. What's that, Scott? One, very good. John 1, 2, close. It is in John 1. 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He dwelt among us. 
the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Merry Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. God dwelt with us. God with us. Christmas is about God with us. From up here, down here. God with us. Third one. Christmas is about identification with humanity. What did I say about that? Identification with humanity. Did he really identify with us? 100% human. Very good. So what else did we, can we say about that? Very good, Judy. Identification with humanity. Anybody else? Guess if you want. Well, that's the hypostatic, union. hypostatic union. We're going to talk about that. Very good, Rick. Hypostatic union. I'm going to ask what's the difference between the hypostatic union and the incarnation? Two very loaded doctrines that mean a lot. What is the incarnation? What is the hypostatic union? They're not the same. But identification with humanity, is that important? It is. He's been tempted in all points, but without sin. So if we grew up knowing that he's the prototype, what does that mean? Jesus is the prototype. He's the first of many kind, but what does prototype mean? He was our example. We tend to think that if we look at the life of Christ, well, there's no way I can live like him because he's God. Negative. Is he God? Was he God? Yes. But can we live like him? Yes. What did Jesus need to live the way that he lived? Never mind his divinity, but he lived from the standpoint of his humanity. Identification with humanity so that when we look at him... He's our example. And if He's our example, that means what? We can follow Him. How many of you identify yourselves as a Christian, as a believer? That means we're supposed to follow and emulate Him. Is that not tr correct? True. So if that's true, then you and I are saying to the world, we're followers of Jesus Christ. But that's in phase what? Two. This entire year, I've been focusing on basics phase two. Why? Like I said from the very beginning, we tend to think that phase one, and, well, not me, but Dwight Pentecost from the opening of our series, he said that the problem in most churches today is there's a tendency to blur what it means to be a Christian versus one who is living as a disciple. So we blur the two together and we say, well, if you're a real Christian, you're supposed to pick up your cross. You're supposed to follow Christ. Is that true? Is that true? No. Why? Because a disciple is someone who's following Christ. A Christian is what? A person who has been born from above. Is there a difference? Yes. And I think that's what we need to be clear on. Not we here. But in general... We need to be clear on what it takes to be a Christian versus a follower of Jesus Christ. What does it take to be a Christian? Help me out. How long does it take to be a Christian? A millisecond. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. A Christian is someone who is properly aligned to Jesus Christ. Dr. Chafer taught this. A disciple is someone who is properly aligned to God the Holy Spirit. You see the difference? One who is properly aligned to God the Holy Spirit has horsepower. Horsepower meaning what? Enablement, empowerment. Walk by means of the Spirit and you will not what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is that a Christian? No, that's someone who's walking. Someone who's abiding. That's phase two. That's why... The Bible teaching churches are focused on phase one, phase two, and what's the third one? Phase three. If you're not familiar with that, that's okay. Come to National Capital. And you will learn what those three are. 
Because if you have a teaching church that will comb through the scriptures like what we do here, you will understand with clarity that a Christian is someone who has to simply believe in Jesus Christ. Whereas a disciple, a follower of him, is someone who picks up his cross, follows Christ, identifies as a disciple of his, and follows him, not in his own strength, but by under the, under the influence of God the Holy Spirit. Walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you to give you horsepower or power to your mortal bodies. How many times have people said, it's so hard to be a Christian. No, it isn't. It's impossible to be a Christian. It's impossible to live the spiritual life in your own strength. We have to walk by His enablement. I need to leave so that I can send you a comforter, a helper, a tutor, a teacher. Once you make those distinctions, now you see that phase two is simply about tapping into that power that comes from God's Word and God the Holy Spirit. People are saying, well, it's so hard to be a Christian. Like I said, it takes a millisecond, a millisecond to be a Christian. What needs to be fine-tuned is how to access or access that power. Access His power, His enablement. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And how many times have people said, I'm trying to be self I'm trying to have self-control. I'm trying to be more loving. I'm trying to exhibit joy. Stop! It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of Freddy. It's not the fruit of Bill. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Once you see those, those distinguishing marks, then you will, try, you will stop trying. Because you can't live in phase two in your own power, in your own volition. It's impossible. So Christmas is about identification with humanity. So you look at Jesus and, and he was able to walk because he was, he was led by who? The Spirit of God, Matthew 4. Details that. Matthew 4. And he was able to ferry the assault, parry the assaults and the temptations of Satan himself with what? The Word of God. It is written. Well, it doesn't it say this? Yes, it is written. Jesus slammed the devil with the Word of God. He didn't say, I'm going to use my divine power and zap you away. Why? Because he knew that the world, many years later, 2023, 2024, would see how he lives his life, how he lived his life. And so he set up the example for us so that we could live victoriously. Yes, victoriously, meaning successfully. Some, some churches teach victoriously as a, there's an experience. It's much more than experience. You can have an experience with God when you have this, when you're comfortable with this, the Word of God. Coupled with God the Holy Spirit and anchored in Him. Anchored in Him. So once you have that horsepower, which is God, the Holy Spirit, coupled with this, the Bible, and you apply the Bible to life, it works, man. It really, really works. But if we're so focused on, oh, I'm trying to be a Christian. If people at church know that I struggle with this, then they might question my salvation. No, no, no. Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for everlasting life? Well, then you're saved. You're a Christian. That's already settled the moment you believed in Him. Now, following Him is contingent upon your volition, acquiescing and responding to the Word of God, coupled with the Comforter, the Helper, namely God, the Holy Spirit. If you understand that dynamic, you can have a successful spiritual life. Notice how I'm using spiritual life, because to me, for me, the spiritual life and the Christian life are separate. They're related, but they really are separate. The Christian life is contingent upon being properly adjusted to the person of Christ. Merry Christmas! That's the reason why we're celebrating, because Emmanuel, God with us, has a redeeming purpose about God with us, identification with humanity, and Christmas is an example for believers. The last one. 
an example for us, for you, for me, for the believers. Not the unbelievers, the believers in Christ. Let's move on. So now the question, what's the difference between the incarnation and hypostatic union? We talked about this last week, briefly. The incarnation was the time when he came into the world and lived amongst us. The hypostatic union is, is, uh, is two natures in one, in one <clears throat> person. Very good. So the hypostatic union is the, com- the um, converging of the two natures into one. Right? The incarnation, remember what I said last week? He's going into a car. Think of it like this. He goes into a car and travels to the nation. Like that? God comes into a car and dr- goes to the nation of U- USA. In car, nation. He comes into the world, leaves heaven, goes into the car and travels into the nation. Whereas the hypostatic union, the word union talks about the convert the yeah the converging of two natures really so let's look at it and uh, here's what I have here for you the incarnation is not to be confused with the hypostatic union and so when you think of the definition incarnation refers to the belief or doctrine that the eternal son of god took on human flesh in the person of jesus christ does it make sense it emphasizes the act of god Becoming man while maintaining his divine nature. He was 100% God, 100% man. That's the incarnation right there. But the hypostatic union, so the the key aspect of incarnation is that God became fully man, fully human. He was 100% God, but the incarnation also takes takes on the flesh. 100% 100% God, but takes on man, the humanity. of. That's where he was born from, without a sin nature through the help of Mary. Not Joseph, he was born of a virgin. Hypostatic union, on the other hand, is the hypostat is a specific feature of the incarnation. It refers to the union of the divine and human natures in the one person of Christ. In this union, Jesus is fully God and fully man. So the key aspect here is it focuses on the union of the divine and human natures. Those two converge and they become one. This is why you'll sometimes or most of the time hear that God is 100% God and 100% man. They came together in the person of Christ during the very first Christmas. 2,000 years ago, combining the two, 100% God, 100% man. Hypostatic union talks about the two natures becoming one, the incarnation, God becoming human. The act of becoming, God becoming man while maintaining his divine nature. So there's a subtle nuance there, but they are distinct. The union is talks about the two com- natures coming together. Moving on, we saw that the Father establishes the standard of righteousness, warning against sin. For example, in Ezekiel 18.4. Bill, you have your Bible. If you all have your Bible, I love hearing the rustling of pages. Turn to Exodus 18. uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 18.4. Let's look at that as Bill can read that for us. Ezekiel 18.4 is the passage. Ezekiel 18.4. And when you're all there, are you all there? And you can look for the Bible. Don't worry. We don't rush here. If you're not familiar with where the book is, you can use the table of contents. It's okay with us here. Ezekiel 18.4. Are we all there? All right. Ezekiel 18.4. Bill? Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. So there the Father establishes the 
standard of righteousness. Listen closely. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is who? Mine. What else does it say? The soul who sins shall die. He sets up the standard. He establishes the standard of righteousness and he warns against sin. The soul who sins shall die. Is that pretty clear? You don't have to go into the Hebrew or Greek to understand what this means. The soul who sins shall die. But because of the Christmas story, Emmanuel, God made it possible for us who sin to live. That's fantastic if you ask me. All you have to do is embrace or believe really in Jesus Christ. Anybody here perfect yet? Callie, are you perfect? No? You sure? You have a perfect smile. Positionally, that's correct. That's a very good observation. What does it mean to be positionally perfect? We're in union with Christ. We're in union with Christ. What else? Very good, Rick. Anything else to add to what Rick said there? We're positionally in Christ. In Christ. We share what? His righteousness is credited to our account. His righteousness is credited to his, our account. Anybody know what imputed means? I have a perfect example of imputation. Our daughter right here, Emily. Raise your hand, Emily. She's going to a nursing program. If she says, Dad, I'm short a hundred bucks. Could you wire me some money? I'll say, no, talk to your mom. <laughs> so mom now has to sit there and say, okay, she's going to go to her account and impute a hundred dollars into her account. So she takes from our account and credits or imputes $100 into my daughter's, our daughter's account. Doctrine of imputation right there. We credit something that she did not have into her account so that what? Now she can go buy something to eat. She has money in her account. That's doctrine of imputation. Okay. Now the Son, Jesus, intervenes to provide redemption and salvation from the consequences of sin. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now we're sweeping to the New Testament. It's okay if you can't find it yet. We've got time. 1 Timothy chapter 2, Bill. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 5 through 6. And, uh, yeah, okay, everyone looks like they're there. Okay, Bill. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, testimony given at the proper time. What did Paul say here? This is dense. Listen to that. What did Paul just say here to Timothy? Five and six. And I put here, the Son, Jesus, intervenes to provide redemption and salvation from the consequences of sin. Listen to that. Now, in five and six, anybody have some uh, two cents on this? What is Paul saying here in five and six? Let me read it for the recording. For there is one, medi one God and one mediator between God and men, the man who? Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. All means all in Greek. means everything. All people. Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom to the Father for all people. People, One mediator between God and man. Who mediated for us? Jesus Christ. You don't have to be perfect. As Rick said earlier, if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are positionally perfect in him. His righteousness has been imputed to us at the moment of faith alone 
in Jesus Christ alone. Man, talk about getting ready for Christmas. I'm hoping you can see that Christmas is really much more than a baby in a manger. We've been redeemed, folks. We've been purchased, and we have a mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus Christ. That means every time we fail, he's there saying, Father, she's one of us. He's one of ours. He's a part of the family of God. He has been adopted into the family. She has been adopted into the family. But look at all the sins. Don't worry about the sins, Father. I took care of that. I took care of that. I'm the mediator. Remember? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. How about the Holy Spirit? Bill, one last time. John 16, 8. John chapter 16, verse 8. Let's take a look at that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 16, verse 8. It's not a long verse at all, but listen to this. Still hear the pages? That's great. All right, John 16, 8, please, Bill. Okay. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When who comes? He. The, Spirit. the Spirit of God. Listen, listen to that. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. This is referring to the helper in verse 7. I tell you the truth. If I, if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, Jesus speaking, I will send him to you. So he needs to leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. But what does it mean that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment? We looked at this, I think, increment two. Listen to what it says in context. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9, here he now is going to expand. Of sin because they do not what? They do not believe in me. They do not believe in me. That's the sin. The problem today is people do not believe in him. But the Holy Spirit comes so that he can convict people of sin, of unbelief. Because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father. What's that called? The ascension. The ascension of Christ. Because I go to the Father and is, He's seated now in the right hand. And you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan. He's been judged. So the Holy Spirit has got a lot of work to do. And he's been working post-ascension of Christ. Belief, righteousness, uh, judgment. There's a number of things that he's working on ever since Jesus Christ departed and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's doing that today, but we're also instruments of that help. How? When we share, when we sit down with our friends, our family, and just say, by the way, you're getting ready for Christmas. Can I share something with you? Do you know the, the origin of Christmas evolves around Jesus Christ? It's not Santa and the reindeers. Nothing wrong with Santa and the reindeers. I think that's fun, to, especially if you have kids. But the true essence of Christmas is about the gift. Not a gift, but the gift. The gift, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts individuals of sin... The Son intervenes to provide redemption and salvation from the consequences of sin. The Father is the one who establishes the standard of righteousness, warning against sin. He who sins dies. So the Father must be pleased. Somehow the wrath needs to be appeased, and Jesus Christ appeased the wrath of God. He is the propitiation, 1 John 2.2. 2. Not, not just for us, but of the world. The world doesn't have to change their hair, doesn't have to change their lifestyle. They have to change their orientation to Jesus Christ. Once they change their orientation to Jesus Christ, now they have access to the horsepower. So that now they can live in a way that would be consistent with the Word of God. 
That we're trying to convert people to turn or burn. That's not the way to do it. Believe in Jesus. Once they are properly aligned to Jesus, they have access to God, the Holy Spirit. They have access to God, the Word of God. Those two forces. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than what? Any two-edged sword. We have that power source plus God, the Holy Spirit. When you combine the two, you have some serious power. No military can touch that. A sword, a, a, a sword that is impervious to being dulled, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, which is the word, and God the Holy Spirit, who really in essence is God, God himself, who raised Jesus from the dead, according to Romans 8. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, what kind of power is that? Is that supreme power, to raise Jesus on the third day? Now notice the three. Destroy this Soma, and in three days I will raise it up. Who said that? Jesus Christ. But when you look through Scripture, it was God the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And yet Jesus said in John 2, I, you destroy this body, three days I will raise it up. And also the Father, the triune Godhead working in sync to provide you and me and the world a Christmas like never before. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? It's our task, our job to get the word out there because if we're just going to sit down and do nothing, they're going to spend eternity apart from God in the lake of fire, according to Scripture. So our job is to get the word out there, not to change their life, but to invite them to have life. I came that they might have life and life more abundantly. You all know this. So what are we waiting for? Let's get the word out there. He establishes the standard of righteousness. Who does? Not, not, the, not the White House, not the state, not the city. God's house. God the Father, Jesus Christ intervenes. The Holy Spirit convicts. So if we point the word of God to the person that we love, the person that we know and care for, the Word of God comes to life. It penetrates and it becomes a seed planted in their soul. You don't have to make sure that they convert or believe on the spot. Why not just plant the seed? One will water, one will, one will plant, one will water. Who gives the increase? God does. 1 Corinthians 3. So moving forward. The following doctrines that we're going to see now emphasize the divine aspects of incarnation and highlight the close involvement of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the very first Christmas. While the focus tends to be primarily on the birth of Christ, and rightfully so, acknowledging these overlooked doctrines can deepen our understanding of the significance of Christmas. Now when I say doctrines... I'm basically saying the teachings that are found in the Word of God. So it's not a mystical or magical word. I'm talking about the principles and the teachings that come from the Scriptures themselves. Okay, So let's move on. <clears throat> this is increment number three of doctrines at the very core of Christmas involving the triune Godhead. Not just the Son, it's just not a baby in a manger. It involves the Father and God the Holy Spirit so that we can appreciate who He is and what He has accomplished. So for starters, the triune Godhead's involvement, the incarnation involves the entire Trinity. When I use the word Trinity, it's loaded. And I'm basically saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it was the plan and involvement of the three. So it's not just the birth of Christ, it's the display of the Trinity's plan and involvement, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and hopefully you'll see that as we move forward. So the Trinity's involvement each step of the way. The Father's presence and proclamation at Jesus' birth, the presence of the Father is implied as God sent His Son into the world. The angels proclaimed the good news to the shepherds, pronouncing the Father's joy and peace on earth through the birth of Jesus. So for that, I'd like us to go to Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to give Bill a rest here. So he doesn't. Luke chapter 2, 
10 through 11. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Luke 2, right before the book of John. Ten through eleven says the following. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, or David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. So what's the sign? We've heard this before. What is the sign here in Luke? 2, 10 through 11. Anybody remember? What is the sign contained in verse 12? This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a feeding trough or a manger. What is the star? The star? Is that what we read? Well, the star pointed away. Okay. Glory. Shekinah glory. Okay. Remember the rule in hermeneutics. See what's there and see what's not there. But that is an element of truth as well. The, the star. But I want you to see what's in verse 12. What are we seeing? Uh, death. And, uh, death. death. Okay. Death clothes. That's true. The swaddling cloths. The baby was wrapped in death clothes. Right? But what else is contained here in verse 12? How many signs are there? The word Simeon, sign. We tend to think there's only one. I actually think there's more than one. Anybody see it? Brian? Okay, location. And what does it say is the location, Brian? Hmm? Town of David, very good. <clears throat> this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Anything else? So location, city of David, very good. But this will be the sign to you all. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. So what I see here is the attire, and this is what Anne made reference to, the attire of the baby and the place. Place, and what's, where's the place? Manger. In the manger. Feeding troughs. <clears throat> swaddling cloths in the manger. Two things here in verse 12. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying where? In a manger. How often do you see a baby in a feeding trough? You don't really see a baby. But we also know there, there was no space in the inn, right? We've heard that before. Back up to verse 7. I want to point something out here. And... Who can? Uh, who's not shy to read a poem for me? Anne, are you shy? Can you come up here real quick? You probably all remember this when you were younger, and that was like what last year. Can you read this, please? Yes. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. It followed her to school one day, school one day, school one day. It followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. It made the children laugh and play, laugh and play, laugh and play. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. And so the teacher turned it out, turned it out, turned it out. 
and so the teacher turned it out, but it still lingered near. And waiting patiently about, patiently about, patiently about, and waited patiently about till Mary did appear. Very good. How many of you remember this when you were younger? You guys remember this? Okay, good. Couple of hands there. And I didn't mean to put Anne on the spot, but this is actually a real poem, right? Is this called a poem? I think we all had to learn this when we were younger, right? Mary had a little lamb. You didn't want to sing that, Anne? I think there's a, a, a musical uh, tone to it. But did you know that there is a biblical Mary had a little lamb? Anybody know that? There's a biblical version of Mary had a little lamb. Turn to Luke chapter 2. It's embedded in the verse. Verse 7. But before we go there, let's... Uh, Bill, could you read John 1, 29, please? John 1, 29? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away... The sin of the world. Keep that in mind. John 1, 29. Now I want you to look now at Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Judy, could you read that? Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke. For those who are following along in their Bible. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary had a little lamb. Really? That's Jesus. Sure, sure. To the shepherds, very right. 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 Very good observation, Judy. So I just wanted to um, include that because when you think of the, the, um, the poem that we've learned from school, there is a sense where Mary gave birth to a lamb who takes away the sin of the world. What's the difference between... Well, we won't go into this, but the um, word is in the singular. He takes away the sin of the world, the barrier. So because of that the world now has direct access to God through Jesus Christ, through the Lamb of God, Jesus. So Mary gave birth to Christ. That's Luke 2, 10 through 11. The Father's presence and proclamation at Jesus' birth. Okay? We also have, this is the eternal plan of redemption. We'll look one more time in Luke. The incarnation wasn't a last-minute solution it was part of God's eternal plan of redemption. The Father sent the Son and the Holy Spirit played a role in the conception of Jesus. I'd like to invite your attention to Luke 1, 26 to 38. So I'll just read it since there's a lot to read here. <clears throat> now when the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38, chapter 1 of Luke now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having some come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Verse 29. But when she saw him, she was what? Troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The idea there is I've never had intimacy or relationship with a man. How can this be? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, Highest, that Holy One who is to be born, will be called the Son of God. I invite your attention real quickly to 35. Notice that the Holy Spirit and the Father both are included here. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, there's the Holy Spirit, and the power of the highest, that's God the Father, will overshadow you. Here you have an example, an image of the Holy Spirit and the Father in verse 35. The one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, was also, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who, is called, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Notice the words of Mary. Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So in the one verse, you can see both the Father and the Holy Spirit contained in one verse. Again, actively involved in the birth of Christ. The Father's love in sending the Son. John 3.16, a verse that we're all familiar with, underscores the, most, the Father's love in sending His Son for the salvation of the world. Christmas is just not about a baby in a manger, but about God expressing His love through the gift of His Son. Huto, adverb of degree, emphasizing the magnitude or intensity of God's word. That word so is huto in the Greek. And the word love is agapao. It's a verb, agapao. It's eris active, indicative, third person, singular. We'll break that down in the next slide. The Father's unconditional love, John 3.16. For God so loved, adverb of degree. The key verb here is agapao. It's eris tense, emphasizing the punctiliar nature of God's love. A decisive and complete action. That's what it means when it's eris. Active voice, God is the subject actively expressing what? His love. Indicative mood, stating a simple fact. Underscoring the certainty of God's love. It's not imperative, it's not subjunctive, it's not a command, it's not potential, it's indicative. Third person singular, in the context of John 3.16, it refers to the grammatical person and number of the subject performing the action. So it's not she or it, it's he. Third person singular. Third person refers to God as the subject of the verb. It means that the action of loving is performed by God the Father, who is in the third person in the grammatical person's hierarchy. Singular indicates that the subject God is singular, not plural. It aligns with the understanding there is one God, and the action of loving is attributed to God the Father. Now, you might be saying, well, why, why are you telling me all this? I'm not here in school. And to be honest, can I just take a moment and say something before we move on? I've had some good professors at my seminary, and you'll probably notice I don't do this much. So this is probably one of the few times that I'll break something down, just like this. Because I've been taught, and I, I think it's, it's a good uh, advice, that I, I remember my professors, uh, a few of them mentored me. We would have lunch from time to time. And some of them don't, they're not of the belief that you have to do all this. I was told and I was advised you don't have to go into all these details just get them into the Bible that's more important than breaking it down and parsing the verb and saying it's this and that and the other we all grew up with teachers in the past who would do that and I think there's a place for that but I'll never forget one of my professors said you know your job is to do this behind the scenes so that when you get up there and teach you're giving them something to take home because if you sit there and you do this every week, 
they're going to be afraid and not even bother with their Bible. And you know what, folks? I, I think there's some truth to that. I don't want you to think that you can't do this on your own. Well, you might not be able to do what I'm doing here on your own, but you can certainly read your Bible. And that, to me, is more important than doing what I'm doing here. That's my responsibility. And Pastor Dan, would you agree with that? Read your Bible? I think there's more truth in that than anything else. The problem with most people today is they don't read their Bible. And I would rather you get into the Bible, the Word of God for 2024, and read it. There's a lot that can be found in the Bible. And as my professor would say, more is, the Bible is there to reveal God, not to conceal God. So you should be able to take your English Bible, open it up, and read it carefully. And if you do, you'll be able to discover firsthand what God wants you to know under the direct influence of God the Holy Spirit. I think there's truth to that. So now let me just show you why I have to do this from time to time to show you, okay? Not to razzle and dazzle you, but look at what I was able to come up with, not the picture. I don't know why this is here. Let me see if I can. Let me pull up <clears throat> one second here. I apologize. This is what comes out when you parse the verb in John 3.16 and understand its grammatical elements, such as the tense, the voice, the mood, and the fact that it's third person singular. It provides a more nuanced understanding of John 3.16. How? Well, for example, the timing of God's love. The, the tense emphasizes God's act of love, and it was a single completed action in the past, and it helps clarify the temporal aspect of the action. The participation, the active voice, highlights that God himself, as the subject, actively expressed his love, and it emphasizes God's role in initiating and carrying out the action itself. The factual assertion, the mood itself, the indicative mood, indicates that the statement is a straightforward declaration of fact. It asserts the reality of God's love for you, for me, and the world. God is the subject. Because it's third person singular, it reinforces the subject of the action as being from God. Presented as a singular entity, aligning with the understanding of God in Christian theology. So in bottom line, the parsing helps to convey not only what the verse is saying, but also how, how it is saying it. It contributes to a more precise and nuanced interpretation of the text itself, of the Bible, shedding light on the nature and timing of God's love as expressed in John 3.16. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for 2024, I'm going to do more of this behind the scenes, and I'm going to present it, John 3.16. I'm not going to sit here and break it down every single time, but I'll pull it out and present it as such, so that you walk away with, okay, now I know why it's important to study it carefully. And when you get this, I believe you're going to have a much richer understanding of God as I do the homework Behind the scenes, I do the footwork, the legwork, as they would call it, and then teach it. So you go home saying, okay, I learned something. I learned about God's timing. I learned about his participation. I learned the fact that it's a, it's a fact, it's a statement of truth. I learned that God was involved and he loved me. And so when you tie it all together, you should walk away with, you know what? God really loves me. He cares. In spite of my shortcomings, I know for a fact that he loves you. And if you get that, ladies and gentlemen, I've done my job. Okay? 2024, will, that'll be the goal. We also know about the kenosis. This was involved with incarnation. The kenosis and the Father's will. The teaching of kenosis emphasizes Christ's self-emptying and submission to the will of who? God the Father. At Christmas, we see this in Jesus' humble birth. The Father was, Father's will was being fulfilled as Jesus willingly took on what? Human form. Demonstrating his obedience and love for us, for humanity. Turn to Philippians 2.7 and I'll read it. Philippians 2.7. We only got four more hours, so 
let me, because we got a flight to catch, so I'm going to try to put some horsepower behind this. Philippians 2, 7 says the following, referring to Christ, but made himself of no reputation, taking, on, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. That's the kenosis, the emptying of himself. He took on the form of man so that he can die for you and me and your friends and family. That we might have a spectacular Christmas when we gather together and break bread with them. Philippians 2, 7. God with us, the name Emmanuel, meaning God with us, signifies the incredible truth that God in the person of Jesus came to dwell among humanity. This reflects the intimate relationship within the Trinity God, and God's desire to be with his people. His people ultimately referring to Israel, but by um, principle of continuity, that applies to us as well because we're believers and as such, it applies to us as well. So his desire to be with us, to his people and the church. This is um, buttressed by Isaiah 7.14 and 700 years afterwards fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. 700 year gap. Fulfilled prophecy from Isaiah 7.14 to Matthew 1.23. That is amazing. To think that it was prophesied and, and shared in Isaiah 7.14 and then fulfilled in Matthew 1.23. That's not coincidental, ladies and gentlemen. The Holy Spirit's guidance and anointing, we find this in Luke 25-38, to 38, throughout Jesus' life and ministry, the Holy Spirit played a significant role. During Christmas, we can acknowledge the Spirit's guidance and anointing of Christ. For instance, the, Holy, the Spirit led Simeon and Anna to recognize Jesus as the Messiah when he was presented at the temple. You find this in Luke 25 to 38. I would encourage you to look at that when you have an opportunity. Luke 25 to 38. Simeon and Anna. The active role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit played a crucial role in the conception of Jesus. Mary's conception was through the Holy Spirit, virgin birth, emphasizing the supernatural and divine nature of Christ. You all know that by one man's sin, all have sinned. And the reason why it was a virgin birth is so that Jesus would bypass the nature that would spill over through the lineage of man, which originally started with Adam, and so God in his brilliance allowed God the Holy Spirit to oversee the whole conception so that he would be without a nature that would be contaminated with sin. So that he could be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Without blemish, without sin, without contamination. So that God the Father's wrath would be justified, would be appeased perfect sacrifice, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Hebrews 4.15 and 2 Corinthians 5.21 buttresses that fact, the active role of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. The submission within the Trinity itself, the incarnation demonstrates a beautiful picture of the submission of the unity within the Trinity. The Son willingly submits to the Father's will and the Holy Spirit carries out the divine plan. You find this in 1 Corinthians 15.28, John 5.19, John 14.26, John 16.13-14. So, I would encourage you to look up those verses. If you have a phone, I would encourage you to snap it so that you can look at this on your own or... Let me know before I leave and I'll get your email and I can send this to you because I know there's a lot of information. So, a couple more things and then we'll close. Uh, incarnation as revelation. The incarnation is a profound revelation of God. In seeing Christ, we see the Father. John 14, 9. Judy, or let me, Debbie, can you read John 14, 9? 
I haven't picked on you today. John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? How long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So you see this profound revelation of God working through the triune God Jesus Christ and God the Holy Spirit. It's a glimpse into the character and nature of God as seen in Scripture. So when you tie these truths, these doctrines together, ladies and gentlemen, Christmas is much more than just a gift. It's the gift. It's a profound revelation of God and how much He loves you and me and the world. So in closing... Some points of observation based on John 3.16. The timing of God's love. Again, the aorist tense emphasizes that God's act of love was a single completed action in the past. It helps clarify the temporal aspect of the action. So it's sometime in the past. It's not referring to the duration. It's just something that it's a completed, it's like a simple past in English. It's something that took place in the past and it's for the world. It's done. It's completed. All we have to do now is acquiesce to Jesus Christ. Completed event in the past. 2,000 years ago. Active participation. The active voice highlights that God as the subject actively expressed love. Huto. He loved in this manner. This intensity. This intensity for God so loved the world that he gave who? His only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Merry Christmas. That's number two. Number three, factual assertion. That's the indicative mood. It indicates that the statement is a straightforward declaration of fact. It asserts the reality of God's love for the world, for you, me, and everybody else. The world. This is the first Christmas. This is what the first Christmas establishes. Lastly, God as the subject. The third person singular reinforces that the subject of the action is God. As presented in a singular entity, aligning with the understanding of God in Christian theology. That's what we study. If you go to a teaching church, you get that every time you gather together. So that's what we say, that's what we mean, that's what I am communicating here for Christmas. Ladies and gentlemen, please recognize it's about the gift, not a gift. It's a person. Merry Christmas to you all. Let's close in a word of prayer and then I'd like to invite uh, Art up to share some, some information some, about the ministry. Is that okay, Art? Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to recognize that Christmas is much more than just the baby in the manger. We now realize, Father, that you and the Holy Spirit were all involved, coupled with your son, Jesus Christ, to make possible the Christmas story, or actually the Christmas event, which is Emmanuel, God with us. We love you and we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on what you have accomplished on our behalf, that we might have life by believing in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that we might have life everlasting. We, great, we are grateful and we thank you, and you alone are worthy of the honor and glory because you alone are the true celebrity. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. At this point, I'd like...